Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, I'm Kirk Gooch. I work at uh, Cornell University. Excuse me, some faculty here. And um, worked in the area of anaerobic digestion for, uh, for a long time. Sometimes I think too long. Um, but so when, I, when I start questioning it, I always see a lot of evidence to keep working on it. Um, oh, yeah, it, I don't like the noise. Is that better? Good. Okay, thank you. Okay. See, we have a good session. People get it all. <laughs> uh, so. <clears throat> It was uh, obvious to uh, to myself and some others that uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, movement in the growth of animal digestion compared to the opportunities that were should be possibly out there. So um, my one of the folks that works with me at Cornell, Tim Shelford, um, he joined us after he finished his PhD in uh, greenhouse engineering, and I said, Tim, this is nice. You can work on the, pro the idea of coupling the digestion with greenhouses. So Tim has done a lot of work on that, and so um, he's not able to be here today. Uh, his wife uh, recently had a, her first child, and uh, so he's he's home with uh, with them. But uh, so um, we had some we were able to get some funding to do this from uh, basically federal money that comes through all land grant institutions. So Tim and I put together a proposal, and uh, it was funded, and that was pretty exciting. Um, the program I work for, uh, Cornell Prairie. By way of paying my salary, put some money into this, and then uh, some of the field equipment used to do the monitoring uh, was uh, purchased by a New York State entity called uh, New York State Construction Development Authority. So we are, um, like all the projects we do uh, in the program, we're always collaborating with industry, and so there's four dairy farms that have uh, allowed us to continue collaborating with. In this, in this case, looking specifically at some things that have to do with heat and digesters. Um, Three of them are in New York, uh, one of them is in Maine. Um, actually, the one in Maine is the only dairy farm in Maine that has a digester, uh, Stony Dale Farm. Uh, and then a couple of commercial greenhouses, and one's in the United States, in New York, and then the other one's in Ontario. So uh, lots, of, lots of good collaboration going on. So um, basically the project is to look at the technical and economic possibility of a relationship between manure-based digesters and greenhouses, okay? Um, so basically, it consists of uh, some field monitoring of the existing systems out there, like I just mentioned, uh, six of them, um, and then developing a computer, some, actually three computer models, to um, be able to predict the synergy uh, of those relationships uh, for any situation. So we started in October 2012, uh, and it'll be over uh, September 2015 this year, it's a three-year project. Um, and what I'm gonna basically go through is a little bit of background and then show you some the results. Uh, the preliminary results are, are showing a lot of promise. So, um, probably everybody in here has sat through at least one talk here that had to do with anaerobic digestion, uh, is my sense anyway. Um, I stole this slide from a, a talk I did a couple years ago at a conference that we did in uh, New York State called, called Gotten North. And uh, my talk there was to talk about the the uh, Y digester is basically the keystone of an integrated in our treatment system. And so uh, there's many reasons why a farm wants, would, would may want or need or have to have a, um, all these things, odor control, pathogens, energy, greenhouse gas reduction, um, fertilizer for crops, nutrient, the opportunity to concentrate and export nutrients, and then some revenue. If we think about that, a digester meets all these needs in one way or the other, either directly or indirectly. Um, so, the, again, I question myself, we keep working on this. There is no bad reason to have a digester on a dairy farm um, that I can de define today. Um, there's about 66, there's about 60,000 dairy farms in the United States. Um, lots of opportunity. There's only about 85 intensively managed digesters. So I'm not talking about covered manure storage that are passively collecting gas. And, generally flaring it or from California, putting it through an engine possibly. I'm talking about ones that are built specifically to maximize or attempt to maximize methane production and using that energy in a, in, a, in a useful way. So in the states here, I think most of us know that the uh, most cases is going to fuel and engine generator sets. Um, in New York State, if you want to get money from NYSERDA, who uh, is, a, was at, is very active in uh, the digester industry, um, you have to basically generate electricity. Um, 
and that's the only way you're going to get their money. Um, in New York, um, we have a pretty good net metering uh, policy in place. Um, it's grown over time. Uh, it's now one megawatt. It used to be only 60 kW back in 1998 when it started, so it's grown over time. Um, but it's still limiting. Um, if, you're, if, if you're generating electricity uh, at a farm and you generate more than you need at that instant, you can basically deposit it onto the grid, and then later on if you need it, you generate less than the demand, you can get it back at the cost. Um, and at the end of the year, um, if you happen to put more on the grid than you took off, uh, the utility will square up with you. Um, and that's not an automatic thing. Some farmers have actually said they had to send a bill, a bill to the utility. But it makes sense. If the utility wants money out of you, they send you a bill. So some of the farms sat around for half a year. Once my flare up kept coming, well, they finally called the utility. So you need to send us a bill. Um, <clears throat> okay. So if you look at the, the second bar there, uh, avoided costs, that's what a farm gets paid in New York, basically, somewhere around four cents a kilowatt hour, if they deposit more to the grid than not. Um, any of you who study the economics of digesters know that four cents a kilowatt hour is not going to uh, result in a business model that is um, attractive, and that kind of explains why I only have two, 22 digesters in New York State running. Um, Tim decided to just mention Ontario, he's actually from Canada, so he's partial to Canadian things a little bit. Um, 72 cents a kilowatt hour for solar. That's pretty high. I think if we, well, we only want to think about that. Uh, Vermont has a feed-in tariff 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and they have quite a few digesters compared to New York on a, like a per capita basis. Um, but what we really realize is a lot of heat um, that's generally available from anaerobic digestion um, or, or from the engine generator sets. And so that was kind of, you know, kind of got us thinking about this possible synergy between a greenhouse and a digester. We don't need all the heat to run a digester. We weren't really sure exactly how much extra we had, um, but we knew that um, there's opportunities to uh, harvest that heat and use it for something else. So these were just basically shots of heat dump radiators on farms. The upper left one happens to be my neighbor's farm, 3,500 calgary with a digester. Um, this is another neighbor of mine on the lower right. You can see the size of those heat dump radiators. Um, and so we were we basically measuring the amount of heat that's being dumped out of those radiators. Um, but uh, we know from previous work that is upwards of 75% of the thermal energy in biogas is, can be wasted as heat, um, in, especially in the summertime. So lots of potential there. So our project goal is basically collect some data from these collaborating farms and greenhouses figure out how much heat's available. Um, so that was one of them. Um, so basically digesters in the greenhouses. Um, so for the greenhouse side, we really wanted to look at how much heat they were using. Even though there's some book values out there, Tim wanted to, to, uh, to get some better information he thought on that. And then at the end, we wanted to, uh, independently of that data, generate a, basically a process-based model um, that um, would be able to be used by new folks or whoever else wants to use it to predict um, um, you know, any, up, any, 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 any cases out there. I have this many cows and I want to do this and they'll tell you. And so we use the data we collected from these farms to, to valid, validate the model as it's being developed. And it's not a process, but it's actually a character model. Um, so this is more about the models. Basically there's three models that we're doing. One is on the digester side, so with you know this many cows and this much food waste, this, much, this size in the generator set, and this type of digester construction, um, this is how much heat should be available on a daily basis, and sums up by month. Um, so that's one of the models. One of the models has to do with a greenhouse, certain size greenhouse, certain, certain type of crop, certain location, how much heat, how much electricity is needed. You know, there's a lot of heat required in New York for greenhouses and then for lighting. And then the other model is basically to bring those two other, uh, the first two models together so that they can work in together um, as one model. These are just some shots of the equipment that's out there for, to monitor the heat on uh, different installations. So um, uh, basically basically putting uh, instruments on the uh, hot water pipes, the ones that are going to heat the digester, the ones that are going to the radiator, 
and um, you know, measuring how much meat, how much heat is flowing through those pipes um, continuously, and actually the stuff's on there, it's on there for three years. So uh, six farms with three years worth of data. Uh, this is the Stonydale farm, the farm in um, Maine. And so what's shown uh, by month on the x-axis is the heat flow um, <coughs> in about a million BTUs per day. Um, and the blue graph is what's recovered from the engine generator set. Um, the uh, kind of off orange, since it's called indented, well basically that's wasted to the ambient. And then the gray is the, what was used by the digester. So we can see there's a lot of opportunity there um, to use you know, the excess heat for something. And the error bars are just one standard deviation of the measure of the, of the data. Uh, so this looks at all three of them. Uh, the, the three digester sites um, and the heat flow again on the uh, x axis or the y axis by month and so average daily digester heat uh, input so basically what's the demand of the digester and I think the thing that's interesting here is that uh, you know, this digester obviously has less heat demand than this digester so you know for the hoop for a whole year this digester has less heat demand well you can say well there's more cows there's some factors there and that's true um, but uh, it's interesting to see there is quite a bit of difference there. Um, the Stony Vale, but again, that's in northern Maine, north central Maine. There's other two of my neighbor's farm, central New York. So there is some climate uh, also in that. You can think about heating a digest, you have two types, basically two heat demands. You have the, uh, the differential heat, so you have to take the manure from whatever temperature it is coming into the, to the heating system up to about 100 degrees, and then there's a the maintenance heat, sometimes required to keep it there, depending on the design of the digest. All right, so this is the uh, same three farms. Basically, this is the Emory Digester surplus heat. So basically what he's plotting out there is, well, how much extra do we have? Again, vented means wasted to the environment or dumped to the ambient. So again, there's quite a bit of, of heat available. I mean, several, several, you know, several uh, million MWTs going on there. Okay, so jumping over to the greenhouse side, um, so in most plants, I'm not a greenhouse person, but he's saying 65 to 75 degrees is the temperature in the greenhouse, so it seems to make sense. Um, usually they use fossil fuel protein, or, or propane specifically, or natural gas to um, create hot water circulated through uh, with uh, you know, closed loop circulation heat steam system and uh, warming the greenhouses that way. So again, we're monitoring that. Um, so this is one of the one of the greenhouses uh, purchased, heat, purchased heat by year. Um, get an MMBTUs on the y-axis, and it makes sense. The data totally makes sense. You know, it, it's higher in the winter and it's lower in the summer. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's what it is. And if you look at it economically, somewhere between ten and twenty dollars a square foot per year is the cost to be a greenhouse in New York State. Um, so it's a it's a it's a measurable cost. So if we look at um, the um, supply and the demand and the surplus. Uh, so the green, the digester supply for one of the farms, 3,200 cows, is the is the blue line. That's the heat coming from the excess heat coming from the digester. The greenhouse demand is the the off red, and then what's extra is the difference. So basically, even though in the winter time we have more heat demand for the digester than we have in the summer, when we look at 3,200 cows and how a uh, greenhouse that will do a thousand head of lettuce a day. There's plenty of heat through the winter because it, it's basically showing that it doesn't need to purchase any heat. So that's why I said that you know some of the some of the projected outcomes of the synergy are looking pretty promising. Now these are not homeowner greenhouses or small farm digesters. These are larger digesters and commercial greenhouses. Um, from the electricity side, we pretty much know and this is well established that the um, change in electrical use on the dairy farm really is driven on the amount of cooling plants a farm has. So January through December, if we look at, you know, so milking center, manure handling, water pumping, miscellaneous, all those lower um, curves that are pretty much flat lines, they don't change day to day, week to week, month to month, or year to year. They're pretty consistent. Um, but if a farm has cooling fans, cows need, cows need uh, fresh air on them when it gets to be in the mid-60s. Um, and that's a quite a demand, and that's the red curve. So 
the uh, electrical use is higher in summer, um, by far, for a dairy farm than it is the rest of the year. <clears throat> if you look at a greenhouse, it's kind of the opposite. You're looking about lighting. In the summer, we don't need as much in the northern hemisphere. We, we, don't, we don't need uh, much ambient light because the sun's up. And actually, in New York, if you've been to New York, it's usually pretty cloudy most of the time. I'm not a resident, lifelong resident of New York, so I kind of pick on New York sometimes. Um, it, it, but the sun does come out in the summertime, so very little um, light needed uh, compared to the wintertime in New York for greenhouses. So that, that's a good thing for matching up a greenhouse with a digester. Um, so that's basically what this is, this is showing. A good opportunity for the mix. So um, mutual benefits are there. Um, digesters, uh, they can sell electricity at a better price than they uh, currently receive. Um, it didn't take me too long to figure out that the utility in New York, the utilities in New York, really aren't interested in working with dairy farms uh, when it comes to um, taking their electricity. They basically got forced into it by legislation but they still aren't really that interested in doing it. Um, it is seems to be coming around a little bit, but um, the, uh, the news is out there, and it's been out there a long time in the, at the dairy farm level, that um, it's a struggle to make that happen. So I kind of adopted the perspective that let's forget, if we can, let's forget the working with utility on trying to put power on the grid, and let's figure out how we can use it on the farm because then if we can use it on a farm, generate it less than we have to, we can purchase it from the utility, and we can turn that into a profit that better milk through the summer, dry our manure cells for bedding, which we know helps cows, things like that. Um, then if we can turn it into more milk or better quality milk, that's probably a good thing. Or tie it in with a greenhouse. So we've, we've kind of looked at a project hard from that angle. So that just has the waste, the waste heat that's needed, needed. I failed to mention earlier, cow barns don't need heat. Even when it's 20 below, they don't need heat. Um, <clears throat> greenhouses need heat, and uh, so it's there from the excess um, heat not needed by the digester. Um, so Tim saying, he, he wanted to throw in a couple slides here about greenhouses, and this makes sense, that it's always important to locate the greenhouses close to the demand. Okay, that makes sense, right? Um, there is some transportation costs, um, and uh, if we're gonna, if we're gonna line a greenhouse up with a digester, then that, that kind of is another factor as well. Um, these digesters don't run perfectly all the time. We can show you all kinds of data. If you haven't already seen that from Cornell from us, um, so there needs to be back, some backup sources of heat available. Um, some people will say, well, how about the CO2? You know, there's CO2 in the biogas. 40% of the, roughly of the biogas is CO2. Um, can that be used to help um, better grow plants? Well. It, it's already been established. CO2 is, is added to some greenhouses, but to clean biogas up to the point to get this pretty pure pure CO2 put in the greenhouse, that's not a cheap thing to do. And there's probably uh, other sources that are economical to do that, but to do it for a relatively small digester system uh, is not going to make sense probably. So that's not our focus right now, it'll be in the future. Um, probably makes sense in greenhouses would be um, independent businesses from the dairy, even if it was a large dairy. Um, you know, so many of you may have heard of Fair Oaks Dairy, a uh, very successful dairy in, in the Midwest. Um, they've done a lot of in innovative and very um, commendable things. Um, but you know, if they were gonna partner a greenhouse with a digester, they probably would create a separate business uh, if, they didn't, if they didn't just contract with somebody else where they have greenhouses. And that's what Tim's saying, Tim saying here. It's probably the only model that's gonna work is that dairy farmers and dairy farmers, greenhouse operators, be greenhouse operators, and not try to do too much. So I'll close with a couple more slides. Um, this is just a, a little snippet of uh, the digester simulation program. Doesn't really mean anything to me, doesn't mean anything to you. It's just saying that there's a program, it's still under development. Um, our goal is to uh, get this program done, and it's almost done, but then basically to run it through a zillion iterations uh, you know, manipulating the variables and then producing some output graphs, charts, tables that are turned into basically information that somebody could use to help get the information out that this, this, this program's there and then somebody might want to use it themselves. So this is the greenhouse simulation program. And again, there's a third one that brings it all together. So that's, that's what I had um, on that and um, I never saw any signs. So, that's because we have 
the cancellation, we know that there's an empty spot. So we have plenty of time for questions if you care. Uh, yeah. uh, integration was a nice time. Uh, integration of you know different kinds of operations is always you know like oh this, this makes so much sense. But sometimes there's scale issues, especially with animal ag. I know on, on fertilization, it's like wow, well, you, know, you can grow algae and then you realize you grow thousands of acres. You know, but anyway, on this, so um, on scale is you know it's one greenhouse to grow a thousand you know the, the scale of what would work with a digester of a certain size would that be big enough that it would be big enough for a greenhouse operation or you're like oh no that really wouldn't be big enough mm -hmm. or would it you know because this is you know, right. thinking about things you don't have to think about ag to go electricity and heating you know, you know, something else that we would need to dry products. It doesn't have to be ag. Presumably something that doesn't have a lot of, you know, anyway, so, but naturally agricultural uses is what we sort of think about. But do you have any feeling for the greenhouse? Is that a big enough operation to be a self-standing operation? Or is it big or too small to actually fit with a dairy footprint-wise? No, I'd say that's an excellent question. And I, actually, in the interest of time, I, I kind of cut out a couple of slides because I didn't want to go over. But a couple of them that I cut uh, that shows, uh, it helps answer your question. And, and so, when, from a, again, I'm not a greenhouse expert, but Tim is, and he knows a lot about the industry. So when he says there needs to be a central hub, which basically is a facility that you take the seeds, you plant them, and they get like they emerge. And then once that happens, you ship them off to a grower, and there's there's one there's one uh, facility where the the, the, the the seeds are planted and they emerge, and then they go off to sell the growers, and then when they take up, so when they send the load of those out to the grower, they also pick up the load of the finished product and they bring it back to the same facility, which is where the processing is. So whatever needs to be done in the way of washing the product, prepping it, packaging it, shipping it, to so a centralized location of maybe four or five growers. So the, the way he's looking at it is that, you know, the centralized operation may not be tied to a digester, but several of the growing farms could tie to several dairies for digesters. And it seems like, to me like, a, a, remember the one slide, it was 3,200 cow digester and 1,000 head of lettuce a day. I mean, 1,000 head of lettuce a day seems to me like a quick bit less. <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that, you know, that may, that may be the model that would work. So I, I think what you're saying is that there needs to be a business model for both entities that makes sense, that kind of naturally can run without a lot of, you know, a lot of trouble keeping it going. And also, that's what I hear you saying. Space on the dairy, right? You know, yeah. Dairy well, going, you know, you know, is the footprint of that significant enough that it would be a problem right. for most dairies? Most dairies have plenty of space to locate something that makes a good business sense to do, um, and. Um, and you can pipe hot water pretty far, you know, under there. If it's a well insulated pipe. So, I think, yeah, I think that's it. You were going to add something? Well, I can comment. We, we actually have a similar project that our company will get into digesters and greenhouses. And we figured between about a 300 and 400 cow farm would support about a one acre greenhouse. So, if you look at, we look at growing tomatoes, that'd be about most profitable per square foot. And that's anywhere from 300, about 325 to $375,000 per year for a gross income. That's enough for like one or two employees. With the expense of the greenhouse, and that really wouldn't take up that much room on the dairy, like like Kurt said. And I think about the youths, maybe 10 bucks a foot, and so they line up to get it right. Can I say something else? Yes, sir. So these were all simulations. Have any of these farms moved toward co locating with the greenhouse? Is it, uh, have you gotten to that sort of Feasibility or well, the, I mean, so so the four farms, the four digesters, that's real data, right. right? And then the two greenhouse operations, that's real data. So the model that so you build a model. So, the, so so again, I wasn't clear. So this model, these models, these three models that we built, again, the greenhouse model, the digester model, the one that integrates it, that all will be run or is being run. It was developed without the data. But then the data that we collected gets put in there to see to make sure the model's working right. So that's kind of where we're at. The models are built, we run in the data from the farms and the model, make sure the model's agreeing with what's being collected. 
So once that's done, then it's, okay, now, the, now we can run simulations. So instead of having 3,200 cows, maybe we have uh, 500 cows, or 1,000 cows, or we're growing tomatoes instead of lettuce, and they need this much heat instead of that much heat. So that has not been done. And have you taken the sort of combined simulation and compared it to examples that exist of greenhouses next to digesters already? Um, <clears throat> We have one in Washington if you'd like to do some field testing maybe. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, I mean the model should be tested and passed to the you know this initial round of work. Um, that's that, that would be fair. We're just we'll take some you know, like everything else it takes some money these days to do it. But yeah, you know, there's you know, there's, as I said, there's not many digesters out to start with and there's even fewer systems that have a greenhouse type for them. So, yeah, so that, you know, that would be of interest to know about. Yes, David? Um, I'm remembering a certain farm in Wisconsin that was doing digestery due to lettuce greenhouse. Right. Do you know the, is that working still? Does that work? Was it similar to what, I mean, what you're talking about, right? Uh, I didn't, yeah, they, so they, 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 as far as I know, they're not doing that anymore. They, last time I was there, they were trying to grow algae. Was it an issue of the I think they just were kind of. But they were doing it. They were doing it. I mean, it was a real example. Of they, they were doing it, right. And second question, you, um, have, have you known of anybody doing it with the cheese? Like, with the right. Um, so uh, there's a. Uh, so, I mean, I don't mind using this name because you can go to the web easy enough without knowing the name to find it. So, Fiscal Lean Dairy in California, they have a digester, and um, their goal was to meet some of the parasitic heat demands at their on farm cheese processing plant. Uh, they've had some trouble with keeping that thing running at capacity just because of the gas compared to the size of the engine. But, so, the model's there. How successful it's been, I really can't comment on. But the model is there, yes. 